And it says here, the Annex Cut is an extract from Samson's Map of America, showing views respecting the New World as constituting the island of Atlantis, alright? The New World? No, it's the Old World because it is Atlantis, alright? It is called Atlantis Insula or Atlantis Island of Nicolao Samson. Says Uri Coechea in the Matopeca Columbana puts this map under 1600 and speaks of a second edition in 1688 all right this is from the 1600s which must be an error it must be an error oh all right so it must be an error so they're saying you know this is from the 1600s and they're trying to uh talk about the date but uh it says harvard college library possesses a copy of this and they changed the words they literally changed the words and that was later on 1741 and uh, again this is from a very scholarly book you know, when we're talking about Atlantis, see the ATL, that's a Nahuatl word. ATL, that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. That's a Nahuatl, or that's an American dialect. The TIS at the end is the Greek. They added the TIS. So Atlan or Aslan, Atlan. We had towns called Atatlan. Atatlan in Panama, uh, Honduras, you know, in different places. Atatlan, Guatemala, Atatlan. And then you add the tis, atlantantis, right? Atlantantis, because that's what they remember, you know. Remember, the Greeks are telling the story, all right? Now, let's see what else these Greeks know. I want to show you some things that I don't think you even knew existed. It goes against everything Manifest Destiny teaches about Native Americans. And I want you to know this part of our history because... People erased it, and we'll get to that later on in the program. Erased it intentionally. Okay. Erased it intentionally. All right, now I just want to read real quick from this book. We're going to actually get into this book a lot in future videos. I just want to read a little excerpt uh, from this book that correlates with what we were just talking about uh, or showing the map, you know, in the 1600s. Now, this book is called The New Atlantis. So it's here, begun by the Lord Verulam. Viscount St. Albums and continued by R.H. Esquire. Actually, this book is very famous uh, because it was written by Francis Bacon, all right? So-called Francis Bacon, all right? Who's Francis Bacon? Is that really uh, Shakespeare? Some say it is, all right? Francis Bacon, and he wrote this in 1660. Bacon is a Sephardic Jewish name. Bacon, Francis Bacon was a Sephardic Jew, a crypto, a crypto Jew. 
and I'm going to page uh, two right here. And just again, real quick, we're going to get it, you know, just to correlate and just zoom in one more time. All right. It says the next day's conference relates how that though they lived remote and unknown to all other nations, yet they had the knowledge of the languages, books and affairs of the of those that lie at farthest distance. How the great Atlantis, which we call America. All right, again, how the great Atlantis, which we actually call America. Atlantis is America. Remember, Atlantis, that's how they added the tis. ATL, that's a Nahuatl word. Atlantis, which we call America, abounded once in tall ships. How the people of Peru, through the South Sea, and those of Mexico, through the Atlantic, to the Mediterranean Sea, did both in 10 years space make two great expeditions upon Ben Salem. But by the valor of one Ataban king thereof, a wife and great warrior who cut off their land forces from their ships and entoiled both their navies and camps with great, greater force by sea and land, were repulsed and dis, uh, dismissed by him when they were at his mercy. All right. So, again, just want to go ahead and uh, just remind you that when we talk about Atlantis, which we call America, <laughs> that's basically what we're talking about. We're talking about the true old world, all right? In the book, Prehistoric Structures of Central America, Who Erected Them? A lecture by Martin Inham Townsend of Troy, New York. The ancient Greek and Roman scholars knew of the existence of the Western continent. It says here, that ancient book entitled The Book of Wonders, ascribed to Aristotle, contained the following. When the Carthaginians, who were masters of the Western Ocean, observed that many traders and other men, attracted by the fertility of the soil and the pleasant climate, had fixed their homes, they feared that the knowledge of this land should reach other nations. A great concourse to it of men from the various lands of the earth would follow. That the conditions of life then so happy on that island would not only be unfavorably affected, but the Carthaginian Empire itself suffered injury, and the dominion of the sea be wrested from their hands. And so they issued a decree that no one, under penalty of death, should thereafter sail thither. And they're talking about America. This passage is quoted not merely with a claim that it refers to the continent of America, but for the purpose of showing how carefully the Phoenician people, whether Asiatic, Carthaginian, or Spanish, guarded from the great world the foreign discoveries which they had made, and where their kindred were enjoying prosperity, and to enable us to see how little likely their discoveries would be to come to the knowledge of the great mass of mankind. Let us look for a moment at some of the things which ancient Greeks and Latin authors have said indicating their knowledge of the existence of a western continent. Crates, a commentator on Homer, is quoted by authority of Strabo a very learned author of the century before Christ as saying that Homer means in the, his account of the Western Ethiopians. Western Ethiopians. All right, so what do they mean by Western Ethiopians? So who's the Eastern Ethiopians? Also, there's two. All right, so I know we've mentioned this before. If you've watched Con Drop and Follow Drop Nation, you know, you know about the three Ethiopias or the farthest Ethiopia, which is America, Ethiopia. Right, etymology, burnt skin, or people of dark skin in Ethiopian, right? So there was people of dark skin in the Americas as well. So the Western Ethiopians, right? So this author is letting you know that when they're saying Western Ethiopians, they're talking about the Americas. So it says here that as saying that Homer means in his account of the Western Ethiopians, the inhabitants of the Atlantis or the Hesperides. There we go. Again, the Atlantis or the Hesperides, as the unknown world of the West was then pre previously called. So real quick, I just wanted to show you what I meant about the three Ethiopians and what they were uh, talking about in the Middle Ages and what was known in the Middle Ages and referenced a lot in the Middle Ages. Uh, I'm in the book here, uh, Lost Tribes uh, and a Promised Lands by Ronald uh, Sanders. All right. So this book uh, correlates a lot of the um, story or mythology or myths of uh, Prester John, which AKA we see most likely was King David. And 
his land or the empire of uh, John uh, Prester John, uh, emperor of the Ethiopians, was actually in the whole Americas. All right. So it says, where then is the remarkable country? Our magnificent writes Prester John dominates the three Indias. Again, if you saw my past video, yes, there were three Indias and three Ethiopias. You see. Uh, even India at that time was not named India, it was called Hindustan. So when they're talking about the three Indias, they're talking about the tropical zones in the earth where the people, indigo, people of dark skin, the Indians, right, lived. Not just, we're talking about like Hindus or, or, or like Indians, like what Columbus called the Aborigines. We're just talking about people that lived in tropical zones and extends to farther India. The farthest India, that's America. Just like the farthest Ethiopia, where the body of St. Thomas the Apostle rests. The legend of St. Thomas, right, it's supposed to be in India. But we're talking about America. It reaches through the desert towers, the place of the rising of the sun, and continues through the valley of deserted Babylon, close by the Tower of Babel. Close to the Tower of Babel. All right, I'm gonna show you guys, historically, what resembles uh, the Tower of Babel, uh, you know, what, what's an exact match of what Herodotus and Theodora describes as the Tower of Babel, and that is the Pyramid of Cholula in Mexico. So he's saying that Preston John's land, right, was very close by the Tower of Babel. Suddenly, the vague immensity takes on biblical tinge. This is deepened when John informs us that his territories comprise the Pison which is one of the four rivers that rise up out of the terrestrial paradise, all right? We're still talking about the Garden of Eden, a fertile place, right? America, according to the second chapter of Genesis. Furthermore, like the land of Havilah, and there's another land just like Hesperides, Eden, or Havilah, we're talking about America. Around which the biblical peace song flows, John's country contained contains gold, all right? We're filled with gold over here, and onyx. It also flows with milk and honey. We already got the honey account, right? In Columbus' book. A hint at that location of this realm is provided by Genesis 2.13, which tells us that another of the four rivers of Eden, the Gihon, compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. The whole land of Ethiopia. John tells us that his palace is in Susa, the ancient capital of Persia, but this also implies proximity to Ethiopia in the vague geographical imagination of medieval Europe. All right, so let's read uh, this, uh, you know, footnote right here. It says, this confused geography has ancient and honorable roots. The first verse of the book of Esther describes the realm of the Persian king Ahasuerus, whose palace also was at Susa, as extending from India even unto Ethiopia. In Greek and Roman authors, there is a similar vagueness about a vast region taken in by terms like India and Ethiopia. We just read from the other book, Prehistoric Structures of Central America, right? How they were saying that the Western Ethiopians, that is really Atlanteans or America, right? So again, it's telling us here that these terms of India and Ethiopia have, have uh, a similar vagueness. They're, they're, you know, it's too vague to tell you exactly where it is. It's all over. The latter, even in its narrowest sense, comprise a much larger area than present-day Ethiopia. It's a much larger area. They're not just talking about present-day Ethiopia, okay? And beginning just south of the first cataract of the Nile, and about its relationship with the better-known Persia, in the apocryphal Acts of St. Thomas, the Apostle moves easily between Persia and India. Starting roughly with the 5th century apro apocryphal writer, the pseudo Abdias, who described the exploits of the apostles Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew in each of the three Indias. The three Indias. This latter concept became a standard one in the Middle Ages. All right, so this was a standard concept in the Middle Ages. I'm trying to show you that when we read in these old books and they're just saying, oh, he lived in India or he lived in the Western Ethiopia or in Ethiopia, you have to be really, you got to really research what they're talking about because these places didn't exist back then, right? As as a specific uh, country or location like what we think of today. All right, again, one of the three Indias it says faced Ethiopia. One of the three Indias faced Ethiopia, according to the pseudo videos. The second faced Persia, and the third occupied the ends of the world. The ends of the earth, right? Farthest India, America, where they hadn't gone. Between the ocean and the realm of darkness. 
because that's where the sun sets too, right? The West, underworld, a lot of underworld mythology related to uh, America, especially when you read Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs uh, and um, basically most of the uh, Mesoamerican culture. They also say, you know, that is the underworld, right? Uh, because the sun sets there. The third became especially fruitful for the geographical imagination. All right, so listen to this. The third India, right? became especially fruitful for the ge geographical imagination the region of untold highlands in which the plural term indias etymologically one and the same as indies okay the indias when you hear in indias in any of these old books they're just talking about the indies west indies all right came to rest for one and for all continuing with the footnote there also were less mysterious more valid definitions of the three Indias. Among medieval geographers, listen to this, among medieval geographers, but for most Europeans, even learned ones, the term covered a vast and distant region of dark-skinned peoples. All right, India wasn't over there what we think of India as a country today when they were referring to India or Ethiopia, right? It just meant a distant region of dark-skinned peoples. What does it, Ethiopia mean? A burnt skin, a burnt face, right? It doesn't mean a specific country, like what we think today. It was a region covered, you know, a vast distant region of dark-skinned peoples culminating in a countless array of islands in one direction and Ethiopia, the biblical Kush, in the other. And so it says, to the extent that his blackness, right, his blackness, talking about his skin color and they're talking about Prester John or King David was that of an Ethiopian all right the extent of his blackness was that of an Ethiopian John's emerging coloration had a long and not always unfavorable history in European eyes it should be pointed out out that like the geographical term Ethiopia the anthropological ones Ethiop Ethiop and Ethiopian were in ancient and medieval times thoroughly ambiguous all right these terms were thoroughly ambiguous. So when we're reading Greeks mention Ethiopians, we have to be very careful of what we're reading. We have to really uh, research, trace the word etymologically and see what they're trying to say to us. All right. So again, the anthropological ones, Ethiopian, Ethiopia were in ancient and medieval times thoroughly ambiguous. When they referred to someone from a specific region, they were close to our modern usage, even though that region, which began at the upper now and had its capital at Mero, sometimes stretched southward and eastward as far as the imagination would allow. But Ethiopian served to designate color. Again, but Ethiopian served to designate color before it came to be applied to a region. Again, what does Ethiopian mean? They just mean you, so-called Negro. They're talking about dark-skinned people, color. They're not talking about that you're from Ethiopia, the country, or that region in Africa. Again, but Ethiopian served to designate color before it came to be applied to a region. The Greek Aetiopes, from which it is derived, literally meant burnt face, burnt face and referred to any person of black complexion any person of black complexion talking about you i've been telling you this whole time whatever his place of origin whatever his place of origin are you of a so-called black complexion dark skin and you're living in america you're an ethiopian then you understand what they're trying to say homer said of the ethiopians Listen to this. We just went, came from the Greeks right now. Homer said of the Ethiopians that they live at the ends of the earth. The Ethiopians live at the ends of the earth. They're talking about America because that was so far for them at that time. Some near the sunrise and some near the sunset. There's What are they trying to tell you? That there's Ethiopians or so-called black people with black complexion living all over the world where the sun rises and where it sets. In later antiquity, the word tended to become restricted to black Africans. So this became restricted eventually to black Africans, meaning either ne any Negro or someone specifically from Ethiopia. All right, with parentheses. 
the biblical term Kush and Kushi, which may have been specifically geographical designations from the outset, came to be translated Ethiopia and Ethiopian. So eventually they turned Kush to mean the same as Ethiopia, but it was never like that in the beginning, respectively. And the ambiguity was thereby reinforced. All right. So the attitudes toward the Ethiopians or Kushites on the part of both the ancient Greek and the Old Testament literatures are strikingly free of the color prejudices of later times. All right. So when the Greeks or the Old Testament is talking about Ethiopians, it's not the same as later on when they're referencing the same word. All right. That's what he's trying to tell you. All right. True. The implication of the Greeks turn burnt face and of Jeremiah's rhetorical question can the ethiopian change his skin or the leopards his spots is that the ethiopian complexion is not desirable but this disapproval is only skin deep the ethiopes had unfortunately been burnt black by the sun but this had not affected his soul indeed for herodotus it had not even harmed his appearance for in one passage in the persian wars we read that the ethiopians are said to be the tallest and handsomest men in the whole world all right you heard that right this admiration of their stature and physical impressiveness is an attitude to be found elsewhere in ancient literature all right so just wanted to come over to this book so we can clear the that whole uh, concept of western ethiopians we just heard the greeks in the other book mention uh talk about the western ethiopians all right so now you know what they mean and we're going to go back to that book. All right. Pliny also, 631-36, locates the Western Ethiopians somewhere in the Atlantic. This shows that Crates and Pliny believed that the great poet Homer believed in the existence of a great continent on the western shore of the Atlantic Ocean. Plato says in his Timaeus in chapter 6, and this is a story we all know, the sea the Atlantic Ocean was indeed navigable and had an island front in the mouth which you and your tongue called the Pillars of Hercules. So saying, very important Plato how he says that in his time you can't cross the Atlantic. It's not navigable. Because when he's retelling the story of Atlantis he's saying that it was navigable. So in his time it's not. All right. And this island he says is larger than Libya and Asia put together. And there's a passage hence for travelers of that day to rest to the rest of the islands, as well as from those islands to the whole opposite of the continent that surrounds the real sea. It says here, Humboldt quotes that Anaxagoras, who was born 500 years BC and was at most prominent Greek philosopher, speaks of the grand division of the world beyond the ocean. Alien in his Varia Historia, Book 3, Chapter 18, cites Theopompus, an eminent Greek historian born about 300 years BC, as stating that the Metropians inhabit a large continent beyond the ocean, in comparison with which he, the known world was but an island. Aristotle says in chapter 84 and 85, beyond the pillars of Hercules, they say that an inhabited island was discovered by the Carthaginians which abounded in forests and navigable rivers, abounded in forests and navigable rivers, and fruits of all kinds. All right, we just read, right? Distant from the continent, many days sail. And while the Carthaginians were engaged in making voyages to this land, and some had even settled there on account of the fertility of the soil, the Senate decreed that no one thereafter, under penalty of death, should voyage thither. Aristotle was born 384 years before Christ. So you hear that? They made that a law. You couldn't go to the Americas. They made it a law. You hear that? Go, go research that. The Adorers of Sicily, who lived in the century of preceding the Christian era, says in his book 519 and 20 that it was the Phoenicians instead of the Carthaginians who were cast upon a most fertile island opposite of Africa, where the climate was that of perpetual spring and that the land was the proper habitation for gods rather than men. They were talking about you, right? America, the habitation for gods. You are the gods, right? That they, you know, got the corn from the gods, right? They taught them everything. 
He speaks of the continent, however, at length and with great detail, enumerating its fertile valleys and navigable rivers, its rich, abundant fruits and supply of game, its valuable forests and its gen genial climate. Pliny quotes Stadius Sebosus in his volume 2, page 106, Bond, as saying that the two Hesperides and 42 days sail from the coast of Africa. The two Hesperides, again, Hesperides. All right. Continuing in the book, uh, Prehistoric Structures of Central America, Who Erected Them, uh, written in 1895, says here, the soil, first, the soil, climate, and productions of the peninsula of Yucatan and that part of Mexico and Guatemala, where these prehistoric remains are found, are precisely what are described by the European writers who speak of the beauty the loveliness and the grandeur of the Hesperides. All right, you heard that, right? The way they described the Hesperides is what you find here in Central America and Mexico. All right, you're listening, right? And the homes founded by the Eastern adventurers beyond the Western Ocean. All right, so uh, so uh, talking about the Euphrates River, right? Uh, shout out to uh, Condra for bringing this to us, our, our awareness, right? Uh, this is a book called A Sailor's Sketchbook of Human and Animal Curiosities in Early Modern Amsterdam. All right, and this is, uh, I guess, supposedly a Mohawk American native. It says here, uh, Nectar Mohawk Indian displayed at the Blau John Inn, 1764. All right, so we're going to go to this part of the book. And as you can see here on the right, an animal uh, that's at the top here. If you don't know what it is, we'll explain soon. But uh, the the book uh, is basically talking about an advertisement, right? So let's let's read about this. It says it says here, the poster pictures a South American tapir that was on display at an Amsterdam inn called the White Elephant or White Elephant. Like the Blau John Inn, the White Elephant also cap capitalized on the influx of curiosities into Am Amsterdam. Animals probably were purchased at the docks of the East India Company. Or from sailors returning from overseas who might bring back a monkey or a tropical bird knowing that they could be sold to the inn's proprietors these inns were not just public curiosity cabinets however for the animals and objects on display also were offered for sale to those who could afford them thus the inn's curious insights were not only uh, exhibited for a fee but were also rare and expensive commodities sold to wealthy collectors throughout Europe. The resultant mingling of social groups and practices was exceptional. The advertising poster that Belted preserved in his scrapbook probably was posted by the door of White Elephant Inn and other sites around the city, where it enticed viewers to come and see. The striking black and white woodcut of the unusual looking tapir attracts the eye so that even those who were not fluent readers might stop. All right, so they're talking about, you know, this advertisement right here, right? All right. Look, look and even go in. The text follows with a broad invitation. All right, so this is what the advertisement says, okay? Listen to this. So it says, to all gentlemen, ladies, burgers, merchants, and furthermore, to all lovers of animals. To come and see this rarity, which many writers say does not exist anywhere in the world. It had been captured in great difficulty and cost in the river Euphrates in America. Again, it, where did it get captured? In the river Euphrates in America. You see what they're saying right here? The river Euphrates in America. This is probably an error, he says. The Euphrates River is far from America, but geographical accuracy clearly is not the issue here. So they're like, no, but they can't be talking about Euphrates River, right? Uh, well, we'll see, right? The work of the posters is to conjure, conjure up an exotic locale for a beast that had not been seen by anyone in this country ever, attracting people to pay a small charge for a glimpse of this uncommon sight. Such a description fires the viewer's imagination. Most would never travel to America, 
but the poster offers an opportunity to encounter that faraway place at the local pub. Belton's sketches give rare insight into the type of re response such encounters elicited, for he does not picture the animal as he saw it, surrounded by onlookers in the White Elephant Inn. Rather, he paints a colorful, colorful gouge of several tapirs grazing peacefully in the waters of what is undoubtedly, undoubtedly meant to be the Euphrates River in America. Undoubtedly meant to be the Euphrates River in America. All right, the river and its banks are suggested with vague washes of blue and green. So I just want to show you something real quick. Uh, so in Costa Rica, uh, we have Rio Celeste, uh, and it's from the minerals in the water, combination of certain minerals, uh, give it this color. And Celeste means uh, like sky blue or baby blue uh in spanish so as you can see this is the color of the river so a blue river right a blue or green river all right so in costa rica you would also actually will find literally a danta or tapir in a blue river or green river as you can see here it says here real celeste uh, uh, magical waters and um there's another one right here all right you can see the tap here it's actually native here to costa rica and a lot of places in the americas and the tropical uh rainforest tap here in a blue river all right literally it's not a mythical place euphrates river could they have been talking about you know the amazon river right near the orinoco again blue river right with a tap here. All right, so I wanna finish up uh, this part of this series, you know, this video. I know you've been here two hours with me and you know, if you're still here, then you're one of the real real ones, you know? You, you're really one of the real ones, all right? So I wanna finish up with this book, Atlantis in America by Ivor Sapp and George Erickson and you know, Jaguar. He's been going in deep with this in his channel. We've been uh, smashing this book up and you know a lot of different books so check that out check that series out atlantis in america we got a lot of parts coming out so uh in this book i'm going to page nine it says here to many minds the stories of myth were revived by these startling discoveries christopher columbus even suggested that he might have discovered the original garden of eden we already got that right the church of rome recoiled at that notion state authorities and historians of the age of reason who had long dismissed myth as a conduit of knowledge similarly dismissed the americas as a site of significant ancient civilization so you see they were dismissing it on purpose but did not the discovery of so vast and sophisticated an empire at america's heart required the rational sciences to at least consider these civilizations as an important link in man's cultural history the Catholic Church and conventional science both answered that essential question in the negative, so they didn't want to write purposely. In the 16th century, the Church of the Inquisition decreed that the peoples of the Americas were too primitive. Their city-states were judged more recent than Jesus Christ and the civilizations of the Mediterranean that had preceded him. So you see that they just gave us a more recent time. But it's all made up. This chronology, everything is all made up. In the 20th century, American archaeology echoed that, that attic by declaring that the ancient Maya emerged from barbarism during the 1st or 2nd century of the Christian era. They were judged too reason and too pagan to have played a significant role in the development of worldwide civilization. So you see that? They're taking credit from people who did originate uh, civilization. All right. In fact, the constructions of ancient American cultures not only had similar means of design in their star temples to those found in the Middle East, they had earlier devised a, mat a mathematics superior to any other in the world. However, while admitting these advanced civilizations were remarkable and surely older than some cities in Europe, historians soon pronounced that their constructions were not the equal of ancient sites in Egypt or Mesopotamia. Experts assured that a Eurocentric world that the American city-states had not been occasioned by a long period of development, but had somehow spontaneously sprung from a more primitive people dubbed inspired savages by historians, see what they call these, right? Inspired savages. The possibility that the advanced cultures of the old world and the new world 
could have been interrelated was dismissed and impossible and preposterous all right so they made sure they had a plan they had an agenda where they were doing all this all right they weren't just doing this because they were stupid they were doing this on purpose Question all speculation that the step pyramid builders of the Americas could have been related to the ancient Middle East. Archaeologists pronounced that the construction of even the crudest temples in the Americas had not begun until after the pyramid building had ceased in Egypt, summer and in summer's recipient cultures of Babylon and Akkad. But we already know that's false. We just got it from Smithsonian.com, right? Karal Supe. These simplistic declarations have been proven false. All right? We've already seen that. These simplistic declarations. We have proven that false. All right, this is false, people. All right, you want to keep believing over there in Egypt, Kemet, and all that. It's all the Babylonia. It's false. These simplistic declarations have been proven false. Only in the last few decades of this century have we realized that the known Maya sites are much older than previously thought, reaching back over 4,000 years at Cuello Inn. And I, and hold on, this is uh, the ancient discovery says here. This is the reconstruction of the Temple of Marduk in Babylon, it says, 600 BC. And this is a uh, reconstruction of the Piedras Negras site, all right, and Yusumantat River. All right, this is the Mayan temple. Look, look at how extensive, how massive this is, all right? All right, so this continues. says, in Belize or recognize that the Olmecs were building pyramids and great stone megaliths for thousands of years before the classic Maya built their cities. Discovery after discovery has revealed that the accepted dates for civilization in the Americas are very wrong. Thank you, UB2 News and uh, Kondrak for showing us uh, the false chronology that we've been living. It says, at Chan Chan in Peru, Chavin culture, instead of sudden emergence, displays a continual line of development of a naval culture that dates back over 8,000 years. Pedra Furada in Brazil is now known to have supported a diverse culture over 12,000 years ago. Monteverde in Chile is at least that old, and many have supported a navigational culture of 32,000 years ago. Without a doubt, civilizations in the Americas go back further than established dates for Mesopotamia or Egypt. Again, without a doubt, and we already got it from Smithsonian.com, right, in popular archaeology. But Ivor Sapp, right, Atlantis in America, telling us, without a doubt, civilizations in the America go back further than established dates for Mesopotamia or Egypt. 8,000-year-old mummies in Peru predate identical embalmed Egyptian mummies by 3,000 years. And we got that, right? The Chinchorro mummies in Chile and Peru, they go, one of them goes back almost up to, um, I believe, 9,000 years ago. We just got right here 8,000 years ago, right? Residue of holy American tobacco and cocaine recently discovered in 5,000-year-old mummies in Egypt and in the Sudan established evidence of contact between the old and the new world thousands of years before Christ. Again, the appearance of a genetically American cotton in Asia 10,000 years ago and evidence of coconut sweet potatoes in the American parrot in the Pacific and in Asia 12,000 years ago all confirm a repeated worldwide contact of cultures that could only have been accomplished by navigation. The great megalithic structures of the Americas, the spears of Costa Rica, the Great Wall of Sacsayhuaman in Peru, Sacsayhuaman, the fortress. Saw my City of David video. Is this the City of David, the citadel, the fortress, Sacsayhuaman? And the observatory of Calasaya near Tijuanacu in Bolivia. Defy the dates assigned to the origins of civilization by our contemporary model. All right, so need I say more, you know, basically.